In this next lecture, I'm going to talk about what I consider like one of the most interesting and impressive parts of cell biology, which is biochemical reconstitution. So biochemical reconstitution is an act of faith, and it's an act of faith in the idea that it's at its root biology, particularly cell biology, is just chemistry and that there aren't any vitalistic forces or magic that motivate how cells actually work and that if cell biology is essentially applied chemistry you should be able to take every bit of cellular function and be able to reduce it to essential biochemical processes that you can get to run in a test tube and to tell you just you know most of you probably have had some experience with this in other courses, for example, metabolic biochemistry, where a lot of the focus is the conversion of one small molecule into another small molecule so you could make the precursors for DNA or for proteins or the flow of energy through the cell. So it's a much broader sense of, of biochemistry, not just in the conversion of one chemical into another chemical, but reconstituting entire cellular processes. And to tell you just how far this has gone, there are biochemical systems, extracts, that you can just add DNA to them. The DNA will replicate, it will condense, it will assemble a spindle, and it will segregate just like, so essentially you can do cell division in vitro without a cell, just with purified cytoplasm. I find this part of cell biology incredibly impressive, and it really is, in some sense, the most imaginative part of cell biology, the idea that you could literally take a cell, which seems to be so complex and full of life, and just reduce, reduce it to basic chemical processes that you can take apart and understand how they work. And so in order for biochemical reconstitution to work, for any process, you need essentially two things. You need a set of substrates, the parts that make the process work, and you need an assay to know whether or not the process you're trying to reconstitute actually occurred. So one of the reasons that I have focused initially, and I set up an entire lecture on the kind of cartoon model for how we now understand protein translocation into the ER to work and all the different components is so you have that framework in mind. So as I walk you through kind of the experiments and the thought processes that underpin that model, you kind of have a way to anchor it in some sort of a mental framework for looking at these experiments that otherwise might seem rather random and, and abstract. So based on what we already know, you know that you need uh, translation to occur for protein translocation um, to happen. And uh, you need uh, a membrane system that will support the actual movement of the protein from the cytoplasm into the ER. So in order to get protein translocation to work, obviously you need a way to make proteins in vitro. You need an in vitro translation system. And when this was first emerging, there were two basic systems that people used, rabbit reticulocyte lysate and wheat germ lysate. And now I'm not gonna say much about wheat germ lysate, but I wanna focus a little bit on this reticulocyte lysate because it, illu it illuminates a critical concept that we come back to again and again in cell biology, that if you wanna do something, or if you wanna study a process or reconstitute a process in vitro, what you need to do is start with a source material that has specialized in that process. So if you wanna make a system that's really cranked up for translation, you wanna to go to cells and tissues that do a huge amount of translation and pretty much nothing else. So the reason that reticulocyte lysates are so effective for this is that some of you may know that red blood cells don't have nuclei. So what does that mean practically? It means that all the regulation going on inside a red blood cell is, is driven post-transcriptionally. That means essentially largely by translation. So red blood cells are largely bags that are doing lots of translation, but they have some negative properties associated with them. So what people did was they isolated reticulocytes, which are red blood cell precursors. And what you do is you get rabbits, you make them anemic. How you do that? 
don't want to know. And you isolate these red blood cell precursors because the anemic rabbits are generating lots of them. And you break open the cells, that's the lysate, you spin out all the crap, and you have a system that largely is ready to go for translation. It's got tons of ribosomes, initiation factors, all the goodies you learn about in a molecular biology class. Now you've got a system that's capable of doing translation, but what you really need then is a way to program it, a way to introduce a single message into it to make the protein that you're interested in. And the proteins that we're interested in are all secreted proteins. So we need a secreted protein, an mRNA that encodes a secreted protein. Now today that's really easy because there are vast libraries of plasmids that are geared up where you could do in vitro transcription and make a specific RNA, like essentially buckets of it, that encode your favorite secreted protein. Now, it's useful, and I'm, I'm approaching this from a more historical standpoint, because what I really want you guys to think about is how I could tell you the facts of what happened, what we know. But what's really important moving forward in, in your careers is you will be confronting problems that people have never faced before or have no clear solution to. And really, the, one of the few guideposts you have in approaching a novel problem and how to develop a solution for it is how people have solved similar problems in the past. And so walking you through like how you build a translation system, how you program it, when people didn't have the powerful tools we have today is incredibly useful in terms of thinking about how you're going to solve tomorrow's problems. So if you exist in a world where you don't have all this molecular biology, where you haven't cloned every gene and sequenced every genome, how do you get a lot of one specific RNA? So at the time when people were setting up these reconstitution systems, they came up with a very clever trick. And it's a trick that's enormously useful and again calls back to what I was talking about with the translation system is that, well, if you can't make a single message and you can't isolate it, the next best thing is to go to a cell type or a tissue type that makes a large amount of a single secreted protein. So it's maybe not perfect, but if 85% of the RNA is a single RNA encoding for a single protein, that's pretty good and in fact was good enough. And, and there were a couple of different approaches that people used at that time. So for example, B cells or plasma cells make a single type of immunoglobulin of antibody which is secreted. So they would isolate RNA from B cells and dump it in their in vitro translation system and it would make the protein, it would make immunoglobulin. So that was one source material that people used. Another clever idea was, well, if I can't find a cell that does what I want or makes a lot of the protein I want, maybe I can infect it with a virus and since the virus hijacks the endogenous uh, molecular biology of of the infected cell, it would make a ton of the viral proteins. And a protein you'll see in the literature over and over again is from VSV virus, and it's the G protein, which is horribly named because it's named after the letter G because all the protein products in the virus are named after letters. And so it has nothing to do with GTPases. And then another protein that people use or source material was from the pituitary. Now, the pituitary gland has cells that make very specific secreted peptide hormones. And the one that people really locked into was prolactin because it's incredibly small. So it's easy to study and your translation system doesn't have to be super robust to make a really small protein. So, so again, the trick is that cells that make a lot of one protein can be exploited to isolate RNA from those cells and to program a translation system. And this is, I just wanna reemphasize this yet again, because we'll be coming back to it over and over and over again, is that the study of cell biology often exploits the diversity and the speci specialization of different cell types and tissues to kind of find the optimal system that you can then take apart a particular piece of, of cellular function. So once you have a translation system and some mRNA to program it, you can mix the RNA with the lysate, and a lysate is basically just 
cells that have been broken open. I'll often use the term extract with lysate interchangeably. And you spin out all the crap and you just have the soluble material. So you have lysate, you have mRNA. And in order to detect the protein, you add radioactive methionine, S35 methionine. So why methionine? Almost every protein has a methionine in it. So you know that no matter what you're working with, the protein will get radio labeled. And the reason methionine is in every protein is the first, the start codon of, of most proteins is, is methionine. It encodes for methionine. So that gets us the first part of the substrates, being able to make a protein, have translation actively going. So what do we do about the membrane component of the system? So we have the protein translation system. We need membranes that will translocate proteins in vitro. And so the question is, again, where do you get protein? Where, where do you get a source of membranes that are highly competent for protein translocation, for the ability to move a protein from the exterior into the e interior of the ER membrane? So again, er most cells have ER. So where would you go in order to get super robust ER as a source material? And you would want to start with a source material, a cell type, a tissue type that does a huge amount of protein secretion because you know you'll be able to isolate a lot of endoplasmic reticulum from that and it's likely to be highly functional for moving protein rapidly uh, across the membrane surface. And so because a lot of the early work was focused on insulin in terms of understanding protein secretion or at least a lot of the motivation was based around insulin. A lot of initial work focused on isolating ER from pancreas because it was a highly secretory tissue and there was a lot of kind of background knowledge about it and how to work with it. So you'd isolate ER from pancreas and you'd, and, and you'd purify this membrane fraction. And you'll often see this in the literature or lecture notes, these, this fraction called ER microsomes. And what that is is fragments of ER because the ER is this massive reticulum. However, when you start grinding open a cell or a tissue, that fragments and breaks during isolation and you end up with these small vesicles called microsomes. Now, what's important about those microsomes is that they have the same topology as the ER, that the inside of the ER stays the inside after the, the ER fragments. And what people found is that when you set up one of these in vitro translocation systems, that if you set it up, they are highly competent for proteins to move across the membrane and accumulate inside the microsome. So what we have is a way to make protein in vitro with an in vitro translation system and a way to program it with a specific secreted protein, depending on what your favorite tissue type is. And we have a source of membranes that are highly competent for trans translocation. So those are our substrates. So we've got an mRNA, the lysate, radioactivity to track the protein and the microsomes, but we need an assay. So what, what are the problems that one would encounter in terms of, of figuring out whether a protein has translocated into the ER? So if you imagine you've made the protein and you would like to know, did it get inside the membrane or is it still sitting outside the membrane? So a lot of students or, or people who are approaching this problem would think, well, maybe if the protein co-set, if I spin the membranes really hard, if the protein's inside, it will pellet with the membranes. And that's absolutely true, but it doesn't rule out the possibility that it's stuck to the outside of the membrane. So what you want to do is be able to distinguish between things that are just stuck to something versus things that have actually made it to the inside. And so the assay that people first developed was this protease protection assay. So the idea is that a protease, which non-specifically or relatively non-specifically, chews through any protein that's on the outside, won't be able to gain access to any protein that's translocated into the in interior of the microsome, into the ER. So in case one, if it's stuck to the outside and you dump protease on it, all the radioactive protein is degraded and when you run it on a gel and expose that gel to film to detect the radioactivity, the lane will be blank. 
because you will have reduced it largely to free amino acids and they just run off the gel. Now, in the case where the assay actually works and the protein made it across the membrane, then when you add the protease to the outside, it can't traverse the membrane on its own. So the protein that's radioactive is protected from the protease and it runs as a nice band on a gel. And this was the first assay for protein translocation, that you would see protease resistance if protein translocation occurred. Now, I just want to point out, there's a few other readouts that you can use with this assay, some of it, both of which tie into other pieces of how protein translocation works or functions of the ER that we've already discussed. So, so for example, what other things happen during protein translocation or specific to the lumen of the ER that we could use as assays? So the first one is, as I mentioned, when proteins translocate into the ER, the signal sequence is removed at the final step of, of um, translocation. And so what that results in is that the, the protein, assuming it's just a pure secreted protein, is about 30 amino acids smaller than what the full length protein would have been if you just did it without microsomes. And so that's a really nice readout for whether the protein had made it across the membrane. Now, that's I'm describing it as an assay you could use to see whether translocation worked. However, this is in fact how people figured out that the signal sequence was being cleaved because they developed these assays and they kept finding out that their favorite secreted proteins like prolactin were all this standard size smaller than what they should be. And then they eventually realized that what was being, happening was that the signal sequence was being processed and clipped off during translocation. So that's one readout. That's another way you could do it. So you could do protease resistance. You could look for loss of the signal sequence. Another thing you could look for is the presence of N-linked glycosylation because that occurs within the ER lumen. So if a protein didn't get it, get it across the membrane, it would not get glycosylated. But if the protein is translocated effectively into the ER lumen, all the enzymes that are involved in glycosylation could then act on it and add sugar groups. And essentially what you would see is that that would make the protein migrate at a larger molecular weight on a gel. Now, there's a lot of ways to make things bigger in terms of how they migrate on a gel, you know, phosphorylation. How do you know it's glycosylation? Often what you'll see is people use endo-H or some sort of endoglycosylase to strip off all the sugar. So what you'll see is you run it, the band seems larger than it should be. You treat the sample with something that removes sugars and the, and the molecular weight drops again. So you, that is evidence that the actual change in molecular weight is due to glycosylation. So those are the three different types of readouts people often use for these assays protease resistance, loss of a signal sequence, or N-link glycosylation. So now, once you've built one of these assays and you use your favorite readout, what can you do with it? Now, essentially, this assay was the basis for purifying and identifying SRP, SRP receptor, SEC61 channel, the entire model, more or less, uh, from that I diagrammed earlier, and that you see in every textbook is based around variations of this assay. Now, a lot of that involves complicated biochemistry, but what I'd like to focus on is a simple experiment that you can use to show that protein translocation occurs co-translationally. And the reason I wanted to focus on this is because it uses a very standard concept called an order of addition experiment that does the way the the process work depend on the order in which you add different components. So I want you to consider two different scenarios. First is, if I translate the protein first and then add the microsomes, what happens? Does, do I get protein translocation? Or if I start with microsomes and add most of the translation lysate and then add the last component I need to start translation, so translation's occurring in the presence of microsomes, what happens? So 
If I translate first, I make S35 labeled protein, then I add microsomes. What do I, what, what happens? Now, I've already told you from the model that we know that protein translocation is co-translational. So if I translate the protein first, it can't spool in through the SEC61 channel. So the protein just sits on the outside. And so if I were to do a protease protection assay, it would get shredded to bits because none of it gets into the membrane. So that tells me that I can't translate and then translocate. Now, if I do translation in the presence of microsomes, I get a very different result. I have the microsomes, I have the RNA, the lysate, the S35 methionine last, so then I can go. And what happens is the radioactive protein is made and is translocated into the lumen. And that is then protected during a protease protection assay. So that tells me that if I translate first, I can't get into the membrane. But if I have the membrane present while, while I'm translating, I do get import. I do get protein translocation. So this is the fundamental observation that led to a whole set of experiments defining that import into the ER, that protein translocation into the ER is co-translational. 